Good evening. I'm Ward Morehouse III, and this is Broadway After Dark. My guest tonight is Mary Lynn Henry, who is the founder of the Society for the Preservation of Theatrical History and the author of How to Be a Working Actor. Mary Lynn, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, I'm so pleased to be here, Ward. How to Be a Working Actor is uh, really the Bible uh, for being a working actor yeah. in in, in the theater. Yeah, for the business aspects, as well as the creative journey, it definitely was set up to be that. And by the way, let me just brag a little bit. This year is the 30th anniversary of How to Be a Working Actor in five separate editions, which means we've had a good bunch of readers who kept it alive. That's and we beautiful. also have dated it along the way. You're also the founder of the Society for the Preservation of Theatrical History. I know that you've uh, chronicled uh, some of the, the work of uh, Catherine Hepburn oh, yeah. and the great actress Nazimova, who yeah. was from Russia originally, and uh, you have Mitty Madden Fisk in that? Mrs. Fisk is on her way. We have an actress who's uh, right now doing all the research and is so excited. It gives her an adrenaline rush every time she starts reading more things she can put in her speech. Now, in addition to Kate Hepburn and Nazimova, uh, we also have Eartha Kitt. And myself, who plays Clara Morris, uh, otherwise known as the American Bernhardt. By the way, I used to think that was really unique and special, and then I found <laughs> all these actresses of the day, if they were emotional, were American Bernhardts. So there's quite a few of us out well, there in history. What about uh, Maud Adams, who was the first Peter well, Pan? Well, Maud, Maud's definitely on the list. We right. want to do more about Maud. I have a very dear actress friend named Patricia Barry, who was uh, married to Philip Barry Jr. The, she was the daughter-in-law of the playwright Philip Barry. She went to Stevens College in Columbia, Missouri. And when she did, Maud Adams was on teaching faculty there. Oh, my gosh. You can imagine what that must yes. have been you like. You know, my mother went to Stevens when Maud was uh, uh, teaching, too. Really? So maybe they, so they, they, they must may have, have met each other then. Met each other, yes. But Maud Adams definitely is on the list of actresses we want to do solo pieces about. Uh, we have just started our program, Stage Struck, within the last two years. So... We still have a long way to go, and there's plenty of actresses to fill up with and write about and perform and educate, and that's what we want to do. We want to educate younger people about these people. What about uh, someone like Jean Eagles, who was in movies uh, Jean later on? Jean Eagles had, of course, her biggest hit was Rain. Right. You know, Jean Eagles was one of those very sad girls who had everything going for her beauty, talent, she made money, and then something just happened in her life emotionally, um, and she just died young. My father, who was a, a Broadway critic, as you know, uh, Mary Lynn, was uh, friendly with Jean Eagles. In fact, they were, I think, lovers at one time. But he, um, she wanted a place where sh she could get away from the crowds of Times Square and Broadway. And she rented a uh, third floor apartment uh, in a brownstone on 58th Street between uh, 5th and Madison Avenues. That building still stands, by the way. Wow. There are two brownstones in that area. Mm. And she rented that. And um, my father was on the second floor. And she was on the, um, I think, the third floor. And she uh, came into the uh, apartment, her apartment, with a butler. I think a cook and other other retinue uh, from from that day, but she, yeah, she she had a meteoric rise, yes. but actually, um, in one way, not so because she was on the road for so long, and and she actually she had toured. a great foundation in the theater. What a lot of actors who became huge stars in the movies, Clark Gable, for instance, yeah. he was a th theatrical performer. He was indeed. 1930 is when he did the play that catapulted him into his first film. Yes. Now, do you cover, uh, now I know you're with the League of Professional Women, Theater the Women. The League of Professional Theater Women, www.theaterwomen.org. Right. Now I've made them all happy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but you are also uh, chronicling men. Uh, well, I, you know, here's the deal. Yes, men are important in every career every woman ever had. So men, for me, are part of the story. But my concentration in Stage Struck 
is the great actresses of the past, because you know and I know that actresses never had any status until the late 19th century. Up to then, they were the, the, the last group of names on the playbill were Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Hale, Mrs. No first names. So when Laura Keene came in post-Civil War, and Laura Keene, as we know, was the great actress in our American cousin when Lincoln was assassinated, mm -hmm. she was a theater manager, she was a playwright, she's a very strong lady. And from her time forward, there began a gradual emergence of the actors. But there'd always been the actors. The actors were the stars, like McCready and Keene and Forrest and the rest of them. So my concentration because I'm a woman and because I represent theater women in an organization of, where heritage is important. But I have to say that when I do Clara Morris, the American Bernhardt, who do I mention? Edwin Booth, hmm. Augustin Daly, A.M. Palmer, John Elsler of the Cleveland Academy of Music. I mean, all these men helped her in her, David Belasco. So we, we get our men in there, mm -hmm. you know, as the people who really were to be thanked for providing the theaters, the tours, in my case as Clara doing Camille, I would never have thought of as Clara doing, but Albert Marshall Palmer was the one that said, do it. She did it. And she moved the audiences to tears. She, he knew what he was doing. Yes. Now, some of the actors in those days, uh, I'm thinking of um, James O'Neill, yes. for instance. Uh, he, did, he was most known for The Count of Monte Cristo, but he berated himself. I think his son Eugene, the playwright, berated him for doing the same claptrap over and over again, which was... Um, you know, the story of Monte Cristo. Yes, exactly. And I think that, um, and yet that provided them a good living and a house in Connecticut and other things. And long day's journey and tonight. And, and that plays, <laughs> plays, right. But, yeah. but you know, it's interesting because Joseph Jefferson was Rip Van Winkle. Yes. And so these men would get these vehicles and the audiences because they'd be traveling all over America and they'd go abroad and they'd do these performances. They were in demand and they made a ton of money off of them. And then again, Jefferson did School for Scandal. He did Restoration Comedies, right? And so, O'Neill wanted to do Hamlet and things and, like that. Yes, and he was so handsome. Yes. He was a real matinee idol, James O'Neill. Oh, that's beautiful. I knew a James O'Neill who was also a Shakespearean actor at the Lambs Club, but uh, this was not the James <laughs> O'Neill. But I knew some people who acted actually with... Uh, with James O'Neill in, in his latter days yeah, uh, of yeah, trooping yeah. America. Uh, they, they endured a lot of hardship. It wasn't all first class. No, it was not first class. Yeah. It was steerage in the ship sometimes. And of course, I do a lot of research on how people traveled in the 19th century just as a point of reference so that the young people today who complain mm. about subways and buses and, and whatever, however they get from audition to audition, should know how long it took, whether they were on tour with a vehicle or whether they were, you know, just going to different locations, how long it took and how miserable the conditions mm -hmm. were. I'm fascinated by the fact that Julia Marlowe and E.H. Southern, who were married and who did Romeo and Juliet until they were 82, I think, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this was the day when you could get away with that. Right. Uh, but they are on YouTube. You can hear a bit of yeah. Merchant of Venice, where she's Portia and he is Shylock. Really? Yes. Wow. Well, I'll, it's it's. I'll look that you up. know, it's like, oh no, that's them. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they're, they're alive. <laughs> they're yeah. really through those recordings. <laughs> oh, and Bernhardt, of course, Bernhardt capitalized in the films. Yes. Uh, the Jewish Museum did that amazing exhibit about Bernhardt several years ago, and you could get the earphones and look at the wall, and there'd be Hamlet, her as Hamlet in a sword fight, uh, Camille's dying scene, mm. uh, you know, all this wonderful footage that has been archived and, and restored. Well, thank God for that. Let's go to the, pr the present and your book, How to Be a Working yeah, Actor. Yeah. Not easy. You may have the talent, but um, do you have the perseverance? Well, that's, that's what it takes. A very dear friend of mine from years ago who's no longer with us, Mervyn Nelson, uh, was a director. Uh, he was a, a 
comedic actor in his day, a musical theater performer, a lovely man. And one of the things he said that I quoted in one of the editions of our book was, talent will not be ignored. And I've always felt that if you believe in yourself and you do the homework and you network yourself and you know how to promote yourself and you understand what this business takes, because nothing is overnight, eventually something will happen. And we hear those stories all the time. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example from 70s television, Carol O'Connor and All in the Family. Carol O'Connor had done little bit parts. He was even in biblical epics. How miscast was that? Um, in the 60s. He was a working actor. Absolutely no one had ever heard of him until Archie Bunker came along. The rest is history. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that I want to really concentrate on more. What is the role you were born to play? Now, we've talked about James O'Neill and the Count of Monte Cristo. Was he born to play, or did it come easy? It was in his comfort zone. He was athletic, could do the sword fights and be exciting on stage. Or, or was it something that gave him a lot of money and gave him security for his family, and that's why he chose? He got lots of bookings that way. So today, we have more opportunities for actors than we've ever had before, but you got to go looking for it. Here's the question I get asked most of the time. In fact, a lot of these questions, and this is from 1986, mind you. It is 2016, and they're still being asked. There is no set formula. It's not like going to Schwab's and being discovered on a, at a soda fountain, okay? The myth about Lana Turner in, in, in the days past. But I mean, I think what we have to remember here is that if you consistently are working at it, if you are consistently being seen, I don't care where it is, off, 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 Broadway, in regional theaters, community theaters, summer theaters, somebody's going to see you and notice your talent, but then you've got to be prepared for the opportunity. And that was going around to our, our famous definition of luck, which is preparation married to opportunity, which we use over and over again. It's getting a little hackneyed now, but when you think about uh, the people who find you, find you. I worked on a talent search many years ago with the late, great Joyce Selznick, known for following pretty young girls into Tiffany's and saying, are you an actor? Um, and, you know, that's all well and good. She said, come see me. We're doing a talent search and so forth. But could she act? It's not just enough for the physical, you know, external attractiveness. Well, what, what, well, what about someone like Burt Lancaster? He was discovered in an elevator in I New really? York City. <laughs> yeah, so, but he, he was already been a circus performer. And, right. And then he became a, a great dramatic actor. He did. He grew. Yes. He evolved. Don't we see that film is recorded beginning roles and how actors get better and better with more experience. Mm -hmm. uh, Katie Finneran, who's won two Tony Awards, said a great story about Tom Hanks. She was in a film, first film ever, with Tom Hanks. Uh, Nora Ephron was directing. Oh, you know, what a chance. And she had to walk down a path, go to a mark, and stay there. And she kept forgetting the mark. And she went a step too, too much, too far. And Nora Ephraim, cut, cut, this isn't working. Come on, Katie, you can do this. You're an actress. And finally, she just fell apart. She just felt like she was failing. She couldn't find that mark. So Tom Hanks went over to her and said, Katie, here, you see that sandbag down on the floor? You can't go any further than that. Once your toe hits it, you're there. She never forgot that kindness. And I think this is why actors become actors because it's such a community of generous people. They know when you're nervous. They know when it's the first day ever on a film. They're there to help you out, you know? But she's also such a special talent. And, and so, of course, she never forgot that first lesson. Why does the general public believe that actors are, are competitive first and nice second? Uh, it is it, it's sort of built. I think you know what it is for right now? I think it's the proliferation, pro proliferation of tabloid journalism. Uh, we can't get away from it. You know, I try to watch Insider and E and Entertainment This and That, 
And I'm thinking, this is such a false picture of people. Every now and then it comes up with a heartwarming story. But for the most part, right now they're doing something on scandal because of some marriages that have broken up. Well, I mean, that's not what I want to take away with me. I want to admire the person uh, that's on screen in some wonderful role. If they're on stage, same idea. So, you know, this is, this is the problem right now. With competitive, yes, you have to be. What are you going to do, sit, sit at the dance and never get up and ask anybody? Right. What about becoming a star, though, of fame and fortune? Uh, okay. Why is that unrealistic because for, for a lot of people? Because it's a total dream. Yeah. It's a dream that people have when they're young, like me. I was raised in Northern California. I was just in love with actors, film stars. I used to cut out their soap ads. <laughs> Remember when they yeah. endorsed products in magazines? Uh, but you know, the idea of being a star never occurred to me because I don't think it should be the idea. It's not about stardom at all. And if you hear Uta Hagen's words or Stella Adler's, any of the great teachers of the past, they'd say the same thing. It isn't about that. If by chance you're lucky enough that people love you enough to give you better roles and you achieve a kind of stardom, that's because you've worked hard to get there. I mean, I've met people in my office like little Sandra Bullock. I still call her little Sandra Bullock because she came to me. She was with a manager. This is years ago. Couldn't have been nicer. Just adorable, engaging, smart, pretty. And, I, you know, you take one look at those people and you go, come on, it's a no-brainer. They're going to be something. You just know it. You know it. Uh, because it's inside of them and because they love it. And that's the important thing. But if you go into becoming an actor, it's never, it's never wise to make the goal stardom. There are too many sad stories about that. Yes, you have to be careful what you pray for. I mean, uh, so to speak. Uh, uh, Marilyn Monroe, I think, really yeah. wanted to be a star, but I don't think she knew how to handle it after a while. Um, no, but she lived in a semi-fantasy world. I mean, there was never total reality, was there? She was so manipulated, and she had actors she admired. I mean, she came after Harlow and all these great blondes, and she was trying to sort of be like them. She finally found her voice. I think one of her most stunning performances is in Bus Stop. Amazing. She, like, shimmered and shone in that film, and it showed dimensions of her no one thought she was capable of. But then tragedy is personal, isn't it? Yes. And we don't know what goes on there. And if you're talking about Marilyn, I think that she also manipulated others. I mean, her, um, her advisors... Uh, um, one by one, from Milton Green on, um, were friends for a while, helped her, and then they were gone with, uh, gone from her life. Well, she she did test people's patience, don't mm -hmm. you think? Yes. She yeah. was very, very needy yeah. and couldn't get over the fact of her background and her mother. Yeah. This was so hard. But when you look at her performance, I'm thinking of the uh, Prince and the Showgirl. Yeah. She stands out and Olivier does not. Well, hello, if you put Olivier and Marilyn Monroe next to each other in a lineup, who are you looking at? <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's more than that. It's really the essence of, she captures the essence of She it. captured the essence, but he did not like being in the same room with her. <laughs> I mean, those yeah. stories are out there. Yes. You know, this great Shakespearean classical actor with the blonde pinup yeah. girl. Yes. I mean, who obviously had a huge following, and that helped get the film seen. Yes. And paid for. Yes. But she, she had something going on beneath the surface. But you know what, too, it isn't, it, to. isn't it the it factor? We talk about the it factor or the X factor. There's just something that you see in performers that they alone possess. And I think we saw a lot of it in the 19th century. Can you see that right away yourself? I can. People? I think I can. Sometimes I'm totally mistaken. But I think there are people that I just look at them and I know. I just know that they've got something that, a heart, there's a beautiful, beautiful heart inside of them and a soul inside of them, and you see it through their eyes, and they move you. They're very moving. Yes. Some people can move you after a lot of rehearsal, but what about cold readings? I teach sight reading. I don't like the word cold, 
first of all, you rarely get a cold reading anymore. You always have your sides in advance. You put them on tape. You send them on. It's an electronic world we're living. Technology has changed. That's why I say about five editions of How to Be a Working Actor, when we started, cell phones weren't being used. <laughs> <laughs> Really? Yeah. We were still faxing. We were still Xeroxing. We, you know, nobody had the equipment. Now, of course, it's so completely different. And so, uh, as far as I'm concerned, there are so, so many ways you can be seen. But, you, you know, even if you put yourself on tape and send that tape, you've got to look great. You've got to be just right. So, the cold reading idea, I think, is an old term. When I'm taught sight reading, I usually give instructions about what to, to look for, because you'll get 15, th even if you went in and I just met you today and you said, Mary Lynn, I have this script, I think you're right, or here's a scene from it. Go, go outside, I'll give you 30 minutes to look at it, and then come back when you're ready. Mm -hmm. And that used to be what we did, and, and now people have to know how to look at that scene and find the signals to make it work hmm. in such a short time. I know that uh, you have a, a, a chapter or a section about re rejection, and uh, I was told once by ha Hal Prince's, it's not about re rejection, that often the theater is typecasting, mm -hmm. that you're looking for a certain type. You can, I think he could tell if someone walked on stage, if they were right for a part, I didn't have to open their mouths. That, uh, and it wasn't just looks, it was, it was something that indescribable something you're talking about, too. Yeah. If a director is casting a play, and I got this information, I think, very crystallized from interviewing Rob Ruggiero, a Hartford, Connecticut Theater Works artistic director. He directed Valerie Harper in Looped that was on Broadway about yeah. Tallulah. Uh, he said to me, you know, Mary Lynn, it isn't about the actors that come and audition for me. They're all good. They're all trained. They've had a lot of experience. But I have a vision of who I want in each role. And if those actors aren't the vision I have, then that's the way it goes. But those same actors will go in and meet another director, and they'll be in the director's vision. And then they get cast. So it's all, you know, it's all a matter, of, as I said before, of being in the right place at the right time. And by the way, even if somebody doesn't get a call back, doesn't get to do the show, the director or the casting director, if they think those actors are good, will make a note about that actor and say, oh, like Bernie tells, he's the biggest casting office in the city. Every musical, straight play, everything. They're so, and, and smash, you know, which didn't last that long. But they cast everything. And I've heard from actors that when they walk in to see those Bernie Telsey casting directors because of all the shows that they work on, well, you're not right for this, but I'll put you aside for this. Mm. So that, and there was a, a young woman who bore, bore testimony to the fact that she thought, oh, it's another Telsey audition. I'm not even going to go. They don't want me. I've never been cast. And someone from the Telsey office called her directly and said, listen, this part is yours if you come in. You're so right for it. Persistence, again, tenacity, again, but don't give up. And one of the reasons you don't give up is you have a survival job. I know in your book you talk about uh, saving a nest egg. So when you go to California, for instance, or Los Angeles, Hollywood, yeah, yeah. you have there enough are, money for nine for months? For nine months. Nine months, To right. live without risk of starving to death. Right. Uh, but this takes saving in advance, not yeah. to go out there with three bucks in your jeans, that's not gonna do much, or to or to try to just lay, lay out in a, somebody's apartment who's your friend and stay there too long. You've got to have a plan. Well, what about survival jobs? So you, you, you're out there for nine months, you go through all your money, you maybe have one break. Yeah, and... which, you know, survival jobs are not so bad because you can work out of your home these days. If you're good with computer skills, there's all kinds of people who need help with computers. My generation in particular, <laughs> we, <laughs> uh, we're still trying to get our, 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 our hands on what is social media. You know, I don't tweet, but I know I'd probably like to learn to tweet. 
It's just what would I tweet and to whom would I tweet? I mean, so we, we have all this going on. And so as a young actor, there could be all kinds of skill sets that you could be using in order to be your own boss instead of vacuuming floors in an office building, which one friend of mine did for a while before she got work. You don't want menial jobs. You don't want something that's going to deplete your energy. And one thing that does is waiting on tables, yeah, yeah. standing. Yeah. I want to ask you just one last question yes. about your favorite actress or actor of all times. And this is going to put you on the spot because can you say or are just too many to choose from? You uh, know, from what right you know, no, I mean, right now, who's my favorite actress? Yeah. Kate Blanchett, without a doubt. OK. In the current, she does theater. She has a family. Everything she picks is with class and taste. She delivers 100% or more, and I adore her. I saw her on stage in The Maids at New York City Center last summer. Oh, wow. Yes. What about people that have long gone, uh, of all the actors from your reservoir of theatrical history, who would you pick your favorite? You mean, you mean from the 19th century? Yes, the, 19th century, oh, yes. Oh, that, because there are so many. But yeah. I will say this, if I could have met any one, it would have been Dusa, ah. without a doubt. Yes. Because all the actors loved Dusa. Legallian loved Dusa. Bernhardt was not the same. She was kind of competitive with Dusa, but she admired and respected her. And, and today's system of naturalistic or realistic acting really came from Dusa. Wow, wow. So I, I see a one woman show in, in the making. Oh, here. I'm working on a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> How you good? And uh, well, thank you, uh, Mary, Lynn, Mary Lynn Henry founder of the Society for the Preservation of Theatrical History and the author of How to Be a Working Actor. Thank you for watching Broadway After Dark. Good night. Like hey.